but amazing last presentation here in the Fab Lab. My name is Kelly O'Brien. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Dallas, and I'm the coordinator of the Fab Lab. This is the third year of a three-year project, which is a collaboration between NSICA and West Virginia University. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Scott and Brackers, and of course, West Virginia University, for supporting this really interesting long-term project. I would like to introduce to you <coughs> Ronald Rial. He is an assistant professor, an associate professor at UC Berkeley. Ronald is an applied architectural researcher, design activist, author, and thought leader in the fields of additive manufacturing and earthen, earthen architecture. In 2014, his creative practice, Rael Sanfratello, with architect Virginia Sanfratello, was named an emerging voice by the Architectural League of New York, one of the most coveted awards in North American architecture. In 2016, Rael Sanfratello was also awarded a, the Digital Practice Award for Excellence by the Association for Contemporary Aided Design in Architecture. He is the author of Border Wall as Architecture, a manifesto for the U.S.-Mexico border, which advocates for reconsideration of the existing barrier dividing the U.S. and Mexico through design proposals that are hyperboles of actual scenarios that have occurred as a consequence of the wall. He's also author of Earth Architecture, a history of building with earth in the modern era to exemplify new creative uses of the oldest building materials on the planet. Rael earned his Master of Architecture degree at Columbia University in New York City, where he was a recipient of the William Keene Memorial Fellowship. He's recognized by several institutions, including the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum, La Biennale de Vinesa, the Graham Foundation for Advanced Studies in Fine Arts, Storefront for Art and Architecture, and the Center for Fine Arts Netherlands, and is included in the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Please welcome Ronald Rael. Thanks for coming, everyone. I guess I'll sit down. And I wanted to, I'm going to talk about 3D printing. And I'm going to talk a lot about materials that aren't of clay, but I'm going to tell you why uh, I think they're inf my interest in them is comes from clay. But I am a, an, an architect. And I like to think about how 3D printing might influence architecture. And this is a graph behind me of a of the innovations that took place in uh, architecture and 3D printing since 1986. And it's listed by material, and it shows that this is an exponential curve, which suggests that architects are going to be using and specifying and designing and maybe making 3D printed components for buildings in, in the future. And so my practice has been someone who's been uh, participating in that conversation. I'm going to talk about many of the innovations that we have uh, come up with along the way. Fundamentally, what we do is we invent uh, materials for 3D printing that are affordable and strong. 3D printing materials were very expensive at, at one time, uh, and, and they still are to a certain extent, especially if you want to print big things and lots of things. And we also explore assembly methods that are uh, very easy to put together. They don't require specialized skills necessarily. And we also like to think about how to connect pre-industrial and industrial and digital craft technologies. And what I mean by that is that we're very inspired by traditional craft and traditional forms. And this has been the, the catalyst for our work. Um, so for example, looking at Adobe Brick and what, Adobe, what you can do with Adobe Brick with the materials that exist around you in the landscape, clay bricks. And this is very personal to me because I grew up in buildings made out of mud myself in southern Colorado and northern New Mexico. And we had to replaster the building every so often with clay. Uh, when I wrote the book Earth Architecture, I was interested in thinking about how man's oldest building materials had suddenly become a modern material. How in the Industrial Revolution, glass and concrete and steel was juxtaposed with clay as a building material. And in the final chapter, I wondered, well, what's the future for earthen buildings? And I thought the, earth, the future for earthen buildings might be 3D printing. This was back in 2006, 2007 when I was writing this book. And I said, well, I want to I participate in that too. I don't want to just think about it. So what we know about architecture and 3D printing is usually this. this is a, I have this 3D printer on our kitchen table. And, and this is what architects do with it. They make models of buildings to look at them and wonder, 
is this what I want the building to look like so to evaluate it? Or you've seen buildings maybe like this, which are kind of crude and people are making them and they're, they're sort of low tech because there's this idea that in order to print a building, you have to make a machine that's larger than the object itself. So uh, many mechanical engineers are building these enormous printers that are bigger than the building in order to produce a building. But we like to think that in, maybe in the 21st century, there's this return to craft and there's a return to material origins. And I, I like the idea of rather than thinking about one big machine that prints one big thing like a building, that we have many machines working in tandem side by side producing parts that one could put together. And so we're always thinking about parts. We're thinking about things like bricks and how one could make a brick that has a certain level of complexity but also a certain level of simplicity that anyone could put a wall or construction together. And this is how we sort of begin thinking about how to make bricks and toys that had a logic and a complexity, a mathematical complexity, but a simplicity in terms of its relationship to the printer. And what I mean by that is could you make a brick that prints under a certain amount of time with no support uh, and so you could mass produce or, ma or mass, uh, make mass complex objects and, and build walls in very simple ways. And so if we, we took that ethos uh, to another level when we said, okay, what if we had 100 3D printers and we needed to print 4,000 parts, could we make an enclosure? And so other questions uh, arose in that endeavor. <clears throat> One of the questions is that for a printer, complexity doesn't matter. You can print a bunch of different objects and the printer doesn't care. But people matter and if people have to manage 4,000 different parts, they're going to freak out and that's going to take a lot of time. And so we embarked on making a project where the patterning is based on the mathematics so that the instruction of this, this structure, which we called uh, the star lounge, is based on a color-coded instruction system. So if you print red, you know where red goes. If you print blue, you know where blue goes. So you don't have to have a complex set of instructions. You just have to know where the color goes and see a picture, and you can make these components. Uh, we liked the fact that this looked like American quilts or, or Islamic uh, tile patterns and buildings. Uh, but the building, fundamentally, is kind of a, a, a micro prefab structure fabricated beforehand because we're making every brick, but also fabricated again because we're assembling the bricks into larger components that could then be pre-assembled and be assembled elsewhere on different sites. And I'll show you a quick video of what that looks like. Oh. Every digital fabrication presentation has to have a time-lapse uh, video so you can see what happens. Uh, I think that trend is going to eventually leave, but. So you can see the big components. And so this particular structure has been, it was first in New York and then in Washington, and then it's traveled around a bit. So the fact that it can be uh, shipped in larger components is important. So, yeah. <laughs> so we're not only thinking about how things are put together and assembled in simple ways, but we're also thinking about how we can take control of slicing patterns uh, so that we can create distinctions between where we want the material to be thick and where we want the material to be thin, and also to elevate the level of the material of plastic. And we use corn-based bioplastic in our, in our studios, but basically we make a dance of the of the printer to deposit material selectively so that we can make patterns that look like this, for example. And the implications, again, are structural. They're aesthetic. Uh, they, you might think of them as also um, economic, because we can think about how much material we're applying, the thicknesses that are necessary, the thinnesses that are necessary. But there's this also this level of, of beauty, I think, to this, that we're elevating the plastic so it's, it doesn't look like cheap printed plastic, but it's becoming something else. That's quite exciting to us. Uh, but, but plastic wasn't the material that really excited us. I, rem I told you that when we're interested in clay and we want to print clay, we want to, we want to print the materials around us, the materials that are largely available. And so I'm beginning this presentation by thinking about the alternative materials that might be available and around us. And because I mentioned our, we had a printer on our kitchen table, what other materials might be in the kitchen? And so we began to look at coffee. For example, all the waste coffee that's thrown away each morning from grinding the beans and making the coffee and throwing it away. So we printed 
a series of, of coffee cups using uh, waste coffee. And so uh, then the spoon itself, we wondered, well, could we print spoons made out of sugar? And if you wanted a teaspoon of sugar, then we would make a, a spoon that's 3D printed out of sugar that's the exact volume of a teaspoon. And so, or a teaspoon and a half, or two teaspoons, or half a teaspoon, depending on how much sugar you liked. But it makes absolutely no sense to make teaspoons out of sugar. So we looked around in the kitchen, and we said, well, we need to make our teaspoons out of tea. And so these are the 3D printed teaspoons that are made out of tea that are exactly the volume of a teaspoon, or a teaspoon and a half, or two teaspoons. And so we had the teaspoon, so we needed teacups. And so these are the teacups. Uh, and so here are some teacups and some coffee cups. And so to complete the set, we needed a teapot. And uh, we decided that if we look at the history of computation and we look at the history of ceramics, there's a very important teapot that exists in that history. And it's called the, the Newell teapot or the Utah teapot. And it's, the first, it's one of the first objects that was ever translated into the computer and rendered on the computer. Uh, and so uh, this was done at the University of Utah back in 1975. And so this technology has led to uh, computer rendering uh, companies like Pixar, for example. So in every Pixar movie, you'll see this teapot somewhere appear in the movie as kind of a star. So Woody in Toy Story will pour the, the Newell teapot. So here we brought it back to life out of the computer as the Newell teapot or the Utah teapot 3D printed out of tea. And this is the Utah tea set. So other things that are in the kitchen, of course, are salt. And I don't know if anyone has ever used these powder 3D printers, but the powder 3D printers you excavate and you actually have to depowder. So we printed a series of 3D printed uh, uh, what is salt shakers where you actually depowdered the shaker by shaking the salt out. I know that's not very exciting. But for us, it's exciting to know that the landscape of salt is a landscape in which we live in the South Bay of San Francisco. There are thousands of acres dedicated to the production of salt using only wind and sun. And so these enormous crystallization ponds fill up every year. And from there are harvested about six, are harvested about six inches of salt that are, that are just bulldozed up and put into trucks. And so it's a sustainable material. It's a very inexpensive material. It's sold by the train load. And so can we turn salt into a 3D printable material? So we've been working on this project for some time and, and discovered that the, the the economy of the material and the translucency of the material and the beauty of the material has allowed us to print larger things made out of components, of salt components. Imagining what it might be to print buildings out of salt or walls out of salt or facades. So there's a moment where we leave the making of a single object with the 3D printer and we begin to build larger assemblies. And, and this has been one of our endeavors uh, since we started. But always looking back at the territory and the landscape and the provenance from where a material has come from and what it means and what meaning is embedded in the designs that we produce moving forward. So we are very excited to learn that the company that owns the crystallization ponds was beginning to sell that property and develop it for the production. Uh, they were going to make take 1,400 of those acres and develop housing on it for about uh, 1,400 or actually 30,000 people they were going to build houses for on these landscapes. So we wondered, could salt participate in the making of the houses, just as a, a theoretical uh, exercise. And so we were inspired by the Inuit igloo, for example, which takes the material that's available in the landscape, salt, in the, I mean, uh, snow in this case, and, and makes structure. So we started a project that we call the salt igloo uh, because it's made out of salt igloo. Our forms look at the tradition of salt making, but we always begin with the, the brick or the tile or the component that we then aggregate together. And if the Star Lounge was a study in how we could make a complex doubly curved object with a minimal amount of parts, here every part is in fact different, but this was about speed. How fast can we produce components made out of salt because it actually dried very quickly, we discovered. So we can make the components and we can aggregate them to make this lightweight salt tent that were just clipped together and were two lightweight aluminum rods and held in tension. Uh, so it was sort of a salt shell and this is it being fabricated in our, or assembled in our studio. This is the interior of that salty glue. And so this was a prototype that we made for a housing project in China when 
many people were coming from China and saying, we want, we want to make experimental houses by, by Western architects uh, outside of Beijing. And so this experiment was funded by uh, an organization where we proposed that the salt uh, enclosures would enclose the more private areas of the house, the bedroom, the, the bathroom, for example, the, the pool room on the exterior. But this project also allowed us to explore other materials as well and other ways of thinking about making, uh, for example, in the facade, a facade that guided light into the space in certain ways and views that were very directed because of the orientation of the holes that built upon that first brick project that I showed you, the orange, orange one, but this time exploring the building material of sand. And so could we 3D print out of sand and 3D print building components? And so we made a, a series of prototypes to make these large 3D printed modules that guided and directed light and, and views that were very accurate and precise and, and assembled. And, and we've done a number of experiments in sand uh, looking at its ability for sound attenuation, for example, because it's very massive and we can make these very curvilinear forms. And a very fast project that we did called the Quake Column, and this was literally designed overnight. Uh, uh, we, had a, we had a very fast opportunity to do something and we were inspired by uh, both the idea of Incan ashlar masonry, but living in a seismic zone in San Francisco, how we could make uh, building components that interlock in complex ways that could potentially um, withstand seismic forces, earthquake forces. And so uh, not unlike the Inca National Masonry, which you'd find in Peru, which has withstood seismic forces for centuries, we created a series of, of sand blocks that interlocked together that had instructions encoded in them so you knew where they go. Each block weighed about 40 pounds, so it was, it was somewhat heavy. So we built a handle into each block so you could stack it. Uh, an interlock, and this is what the surface looked like. And you can see the precision of how well these you lock together. And uh, you can see some of the instructions there, knowing where it goes, and the handle a little bit, this little lip. So this is what we call the quake column. And of course, a material that's very available to us underneath our feet uh, is clay. And we were interested and curious to know how man's oldest additive manufacturing technology could be rethought in the 21st century. And we begin this work back in 2009, I guess, of just inventing materials for uh, 3D printing that allowed us to take the computer files and then print them out out of raw clay. And it was from that point that we began to put them in the kiln and fire them, think about their precision, their deformation, and what we would do with this material. So, some of the things back then in 2009, we said, oh, well, we would make bricks. We'd make bricks that maybe hold plants, and it would insert into traditional construction systems. Um, and is, is that a good idea? I don't know. We're, we've been experimenting this entire time. Could we print bricks that were filled with air pockets, and would that be insulative, for example? And we're always looking back in history for inspiration and technologies that could be adapted in the 21st century. So we're very interested in this passive uh, cooling technique that's used still today throughout the Mediterranean and in the Middle East and in Africa, in which a very porous ceramic water vessel is placed in a window in an arid climate filled with water, and as that water evaporates through that pot, it humidifies the air, and so a, a warm breeze would wash over the pot and bring humidified air into a space and thus lowers the temperature. It's the, an ancient swamp cooler. Maybe, maybe if you live in the desert, you have swamp coolers, which are just blowing humidified air into a house and dropping the temperature substantially. So could we take this technology and combine it into a single building component? Because we discovered that the 3D printer allowed for us to make very porous ceramic objects, hyper-porous uh, in, in a way. And we noticed that when they got wet, they absorbed water like a sponge. And so we created two levels of porosity, the micro porosity through which capillary action would suck in the water and, and hold it, and then other openings that allowed warm breezes to blow through and then humidify the air. So we call this the cool break. <coughs> Excuse me. We also thought it was interesting that all of the, the mesh from the uh, componentry would allow mortar to grab it, giving a certain tensile strength to mortar, which doesn't have any tensile bond to, to flat bricks. And so in a very unapologetic way, we stacked these together to demonstrate the potential of these bricks. The, the relief is to keep the brick largely in shade 
which is also a traditional technique in, in hot, arid countries where there's a lot of sun. So the relief will cast a shadow onto the surface of the wall. I'm going to take a drink of water. I can never take a drink of water again and not think of Marco Rubio. One second. <laughs> I talked about G-code PLA before, uh, and then we began to apply th those same techniques to, G to clay, where we're taking the instructions that talk to the printer, and rather than designing the form, about three years ago, we started to think, well, could we design those instructions? Could we think about how we could create that dance with the material, and what would the material outcomes be? And so we discovered that we could make objects like this, for example, that look like that, or objects that look like this. <coughs> At the time, we didn't know what the potential of that was. And I should mention, I'm not, a, I'm not a ceramic artist. I have a very close relationship to buildings made of earth. But this became what I felt was our first foyer into using ceramic bodies and thinking about clay. And, and we were making objects that looked like vessels but had a very different textures. Uh, but we weren't so concerned about their ability to hold water or their ability to be functional. We were just interested in the behavior. So we saved every experiment along the way when we just kept printing. And we printed hundreds of these objects just wondering about material behavior and what we would discover based on different algorithms. Uh, and we became very excited about the potential of the algorithms that seem to express clay not as a series of linear coiled strata, but almost as knitting or crocheting. And this became very excited to us. And, and it allowed us to return to thinking about a relationship to architecture, how we could 3D print curtains or curtain walls or facades again, and how we would think about them at a component scale. Uh, and we could imagine these kinds of rain screens or, or surfaces or building components and what we would do to apply them to a building. Uh, and so these experiments, even though we don't know what they do, they lead us in other directions. They lead us into paths of discovery and design. We also explored other materials like paper, newsprint, uh, for example, taking just a newspaper, grinding up to powder, and turning it into a 3D printable material, which led us to explore materials like wood. And there's about 7 million tons of wood available in the United States each year from the construction industry. So how could we take what is fundamentally a subtractive endeavor, beginning with forest and a tree, to 2 by 4s and 2 by 6s to sawdust, and turn that into an endeavor that was additive, to turn waste material and upcycle it into the 3D printed wood. And so we've explored and invented a material of 3D printed wood that is largely wood that is almost 80% uh, wood. And interestingly enough, the wood returns to kind of a woody state uh, because of the layers of, of additive manufacturing. It, when you have a curvature, you begin to see this grain. But it's not the grain of the 3D printing. It's the grain of the wood in some way trying to recall and reinforce its past history. But also, there's these unnatural possibilities that we can print so thin that the material can be translucent. Uh, we printed with a number of materials, softwoods, hardwoods, uh, woods that we didn't even know what they were. They just arrived on our doorstep from some company, and they had rat bones in them, and those seemed to work as well. Uh, but we're always thinking about the components uh, and how we could aggregate them, how we can take a single tile or a single brick, aggregate it together, and to create structures that are uh, on their way to becoming architectural, on their way to becoming walls or screens or facades, and still maintaining a quality of material, and I believe a quality of craft that is related to its provenance and, and history. Our experiments in paper and wood led us to think about the materials that are available also in the Bay Area and just across the way in Sonoma, where there's an enormous amount of waste grape skins and so there was a company that was trying to sell the, the, these grape skins as a flower or as a fertilizer or as, a f as food for cows. Uh, and so we uh, took some grape skins in the history of our, or in the tradition of our own metamaterials, we produced a series of Chardonnay wine goblets made out of Chardonnay. And then we were approached by uh, an architect there, Andrew Cudless, who said, hey, I want to print a, an ice bucket out of the Chardonnay. And so we helped him print this 3D printed ice bucket for Design Miami a couple of years. 
ago, and, and uh, we also assisted with the making of these tables for this exhibition at Design Miami. Some other materials that are in the landscape, rubber. This is an aerial photograph of the largest tire landfill in the world in Kuwait, where they recycle 0% of their tires. Uh, in the US, we recycle about 80% of our tires, but still, the, there's about th 300 million tires that are disposed of every year in the United States. And so could we take uh, that material and turn it into an additive manufactured material uh, and upcycle it? And so we've been working with this company that uh, freezes tires using liquid nitrogen and pulverize them into a dust. And so we've taken that powder and using our own experience, we've turned it into a 3D printable material. And so these are some of the, the objects that we've made out of that recycled tire. If you're in San Francisco, you can see this one now at SF Moment an exhibit called Designed in California. And then, of course, another material is cement. And that is the most common material that is talked about in the realm of architecture. Uh, often, you're extruding mortar, fundamentally. So it's non-structural and doesn't have the same capacity as concrete. Uh, but it requires an enormous amount of water. Uh, but the difference for us is that we are using very little water, applying it to dried uh, Portland cement and to create a, a kind of new composite material, a composite material that doesn't require formwork, a composite material that is very strong, in fact, in compression, stronger than typical concrete. Uh, and it can be printed very thin and is also very lightweight, so it can have translucent properties. You can drill into it, you can sand it, you can paint it. It's sort of because as a composite, it's a strange, uh, has a strange relationship to maybe fiberglass or the material we're saying it is or uh, to a kind of new material possibility. And so very large objects like this are extremely lightweight and this one's held together just with paper clips. So we can make a series of complex parts. It would be difficult, if not impossible, to make via molds. Not that these ones aren't, aren't necessarily, but you would have to make lots of different kinds of molds to make that, assemble them together to make complex objects. And we did this with Andrew Cudless as well. Um, we were invited in 2010 to make a bench for, to watch the America's Cup, which was taking place in, in the Bay Area that year. And so just as a look into our process, we were inspired by this sea slug that was recently discovered off the coast of California and the beautiful kind of uh, pattern that was on its, on its back. And so we looked to also a traditional patterning, patterning system, arabesque or, or karakutsa, these Japanese techniques where you take a single pattern and you can randomly rotate it uh, on a surface and you would have a pattern that was never repeating. And so this is one brick that's just rotated in different directions, and you have this uh, non-repeating pattern. And so we would take that uh, traditional technique, and we would apply it to a surface so that we could generate a series of parts that were large enough to fit in the printer, that were optimized for printing the, ma the most amount of parts in a printer, and then we could lay them out and assemble them uh, in, our, in our lab and in our studio. And here it is assembled, and there's the final uh, seat, which we call the seat slug. And what's exciting for us about this process is that, one, we're able to manufacture large objects ourselves uh, using materials that have meaning and have a material quality and that are not expensive for us, relatively expensive. For us, when we began, uh, a 100-pound bag, uh, 100 bag of 3D printed powder but from the company cost $3,000. So we can make objects like this, and they were risky, and they cost $60. Uh, but, but now we can make 100 pounds for about $20. And so that allowed us to think about how we can move from the render uh, and the design to the actual structure uh, without worrying about these kind of, its relationship to 3D printing, at least. And so whereas we're still doing what architects do, where we're taking our digital designs and 3D printing them at a small scale and evaluating them and asking questions about them to improve them or optimize them or just ask questions of the design and its beauty, we can now take those same files and we can 3D print the actual structure, the actual object. And this is one of the larger things that we've printed made out of uh, iron oxide free cement, which is a kind of Portland cement that has the iron oxide removed, so it's a little bit whiter and brighter. Yeah, but we call this project Bloom 
And I've told you some of the constraints of our previous projects about speed and about uh, file management, for example. But in this project, it, we had to move quite quickly. And we were wondering how we could create a complex surface uh, without designing each block like we did in the seat slug, for example. And so in this case, we just used a black and white image pattern to tell the surface when to turn on an opening and when to close down the opening. And so it, uh, it resulted in a very figural pattern applied to the surface like this that would allow light to penetrate through the object. Um, the structure itself was a doubly curved surface to keep it very rigid. And you can see, let's see in this slide here if it shows up, that it's, it's basically a torqued plus sign, and which gives it its rigidity. And it's about six inches thick on the bottom uh, in terms of its structural fin and about an inch and a half on the top. So it's not a massive block. It's a block that has a series of structural ribs carved in or, or printed into the pattern. So you can see this juxtaposition between the 21st century concrete and the, the brutalist concrete. But ultimately, the same idea that each brick can be aggregated and prefabricated into larger panels, because this structure had to be printed in the lab, then it had to be taken outside for an exhibition, and then it had to be put on a series of boxes and shipped to Thailand, and which uh, it was funded by a Thai concrete company. So you can see how easily, within just about an hour and a half, we're able to take all the parts from upstairs to downstairs and put them all together and have a party. But again, I'd like to think that these, these forms and these patterns don't leave very far from the ideas and origins of looking at the traditions from where they came from, traditions that I, I studied or I lived in or lived with uh, along the way of my own architectural journey. So I've showed you many different kinds of materials in their singularity, but many people often ask us, well, do you ever bring it all together? Do you ever combine materials? Do you print uh, ma multiple materials at the same time, can you do that? And so we begin to ask questions about that in a number of ways. The fact that we have a number of materials in our palette now and, and under our control, we begin to conceive of, of surfaces and enclosures like this that were made of Chardonnay and coffee and sawdust and cement and sometimes different combinations thereof. So we're using the waste from our own studio to make objects. And because of this overflow, we began to discover, oh, some of the materials behave the same, at least in their relationship to the 3D printer. So what you see above on top of this object is 100% Chardonnay, and at the bottom is 100% Portland cement. And there's this gradient that exists through the material. I don't know what it's good for, but it's interesting to think about this relationship between a biological material and a geological, geological material uh, and, and what, it, what that means in the history of object making. So uh, again, Chardonnay, Portland cement, and this kind of uh, gradient that exists between. In this one, uh, at the bottom, 100% uh, Portland cement. At the top, can anybody guess? No, oh, that's curry. So it's, it's curry powder. And so I don't know what that's good for. We're, we're doing an ex exhibition right now at the Cooper Hewitt in New York, which is called Design Beyond the Visual Senses, I think. And so we've produced a series of objects made out of cotton candy and curry and coffee, and it's really about smelling these objects. And so these relationships of uh, materials are exciting, exciting to us. And recently, we produced a series of objects in ceramic. And they were, they were very much inspired by my own work on the US-Mexico border, which Kelly mentioned earlier, uh, which is, is a slightly different subject, but born of the same mother, I'd say. But this is a moment where they overlap, because at the time I was inspired to make these objects, I was in uh, Juarez, Mexico, and our president announced that there are a lot of bad hombres at the border. And I thought, oh, that's interesting, bad hombres at the border. And here I am at, at the border. But, but does he mean bad hombres, or does he mean bad hombres? Hombres means man. Hombres is a gradient, a shade between dark and light. And so we produce these objects that we call bad hombres to explore these relationships between dark and light and the distinctions that exist uh, ac across borders and in an, a single objects. And, and when we zoom in, we'd find the, own dis the singular distinction in each layer. Uh, so these are all the bad hombres of the border. <laughs> 
But these are architectural experiments in my mind. They're not about necessarily making vessels. They're about making objects that we ascribe meaning to through their place and their history. And we are thinking about how these could become architecture. Uh, and so one way, another way that we're bringing this all together is that we recently, well, this book comes out next month called Printing Architecture, Innovative Recipes for 3D Printing. But we open source many of these recipes so that people can do this themselves. And we talk about the history of our own history of making, uh, of, of working on the 3D printed architecture projects. Um, and we also are embarking on thinking about software, how we can take control of software in such a way. Let's see, this is a video. Let's see how I play it. There we go. So, you know, the, the, I'm sitting often in the Potterbot booth downstairs. Uh, I work very closely with that, that company. But the biggest problem for most people uh, is that they, can, they might be able to afford a Potterbot machine, but how do they produce the content? And so we've made this very simple software with sliders that you can just move around the sliders uh, relative to a curve, just like your hands, and you can make these objects that would make the instructions that could, you could then print yourself. So there's an infinite number of possibilities. <coughs> Excuse me. And we've also embarked on the making of hardware. So uh, last year, I called up Danny at 3D Potter, and I said, Danny, I have this idea. Could we make a, a, a printer that spins around itself so it can print a large space that's larger than the machine itself? And he said, yeah, let's, let's do it. And so we're, we, now you can see this printer downstairs, and it's, you know, it's, it's actually in its commercial version, but we were thinking about many issues about how we can make this uh, bigger and more accurate and have more feed. But the idea is that we could take this object and print not only many small objects because of its very large area of printing, but also uh, walls, for example. And you can imagine if we had more space there and more clay, we could print all around itself and go up until we enclose the printer inside the object itself. Wouldn't that be a, an awesome project? But we're also working on this idea of a delivery system of material. How can we take a massive amount of material and go out in the site and just shovel in clay and print uh, infinitely large objects using clay. So this is a this is a manual 3D printer. I don't know if you've ever seen one, uh, but this is one. And uh, so we're experimenting with with uh, producing clay. And so these are our first experiments in a feed system that could take large amounts any any amount of clay and you continue to feed it into the printer itself to produce very large objects. So this is where we are in this stage because we have visions for taking these machines on the road taking soil from the site and printing very large uh, objects that are on their way to thinking about building at the architectural scale. And so coupled with this, we have to think about the material. And so uh, not so long ago, in front of Worcester Hall on the University of California Berkeley campus, they were doing a construction project. And I noticed the amount of clay that was in that uh, excavation. So we went out there, and we got the clay, and we dug, dug some up, we brought it into the lab. We, we screened it, and we produced these series of objects that we call Worcesterware, uh, because it was in front of Worcester Hall. And so these are some of the Worcesterware objects that are just made out of uh, earthenware dug from right in front of the, the studio of campus. This year, we got to make this go one step further. We were invited by uh, Google Arts and Culture and the Museum of Mumbai to reflect on their history of ceramics, to produce a series of ceramic objects that were uh, sprung out of an installation that was done by Google, where anyone could enter the museum <coughs> and create a ceramic vessel with a word uh, that would appear on it. And the ceramic vessels would get larger based on the popularity of the word, so based on the thousands of people that visited this ceramics exhibition in Mumbai they would write a word in on the iPads, and, <coughs> and it would appear on the vessel. And then they called us in and said, hey, could you actually 3D print the vessels with the word on them? And, uh, and we could include them in the exhibition, because this ex exhibition will take place again in 100 years. And it would be nice to have these future relics for 100 years from now. And we said, sure. And so they said, OK, well, just print out the objects with some words on them. Here are the list of words, and, and then mail them to Mumbai from California. And we said, no, we have to go there. And it has to be printed with, with Indian soil, with Indian clay. And we have to work with ceramic artists from India. Otherwise, this has no meaning. And so they flew us to uh, Mumbai. And because they're Google, uh, 
They called up the most famous ceramic artist in India, uh, 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 Brahman Panajit. And so I didn't know this was him right there when I first walked in the door. Uh, he, there was a guy who said, I'll help you load all the tubes and we'll make this clay that he dug up himself. And so there was all this clay and he was showing us that he and his guys just excavated and crushed and were filtering for me. And, uh, and so that's, that's uh, Brahma Panajit there standing next to me. Uh, and that's me. I'm really big, I guess. <laughs> and so we, we took the most popular words from this exhibition, and we were required to print them in two languages, uh, English and, and Hindi, on the same object. So <clears throat> uh, words like book or plastic or can uh, or mobile uh, were some of the more popular words. And, and of course, after we gave a tour to about 100, uh, what, like 800 uh, elementary school students, and they went up there the stairs to the exhibition, 3D printing was now one of the more popular words. We had to figure out how to put 3D printing on, on one of the vessels. Uh, here's book in, in Hindi. And does anybody read Hindi? Everyone says they can read that. Uh, it says book. I don't remember what that was. Can. Computer, I think. So again, working through tradition, uh, working with technology, not seeing them as opposing ends of the spectrum, of the technological spectrum, but thinking about how we can stitch them together in meaningful ways. And so, while I don't know what I'm doing on the right-hand side of that screen, it's very well known that what's happening on the left-hand screen is both beautiful and functional in that these, this is permanent scaffolding that it's constructed onto the surface of the building so people can climb up the building every year and replaster it with mud. And so what do we discover out of artistic experiments <clears throat> or out of aesthetic experiments or design experiments? So one thing that we discovered is that this has the potential to be used in artificial uh, bird's nest off the coast of California. So we're using these same patterning systems to create a micro shading surface, one that also has porosity so it can be ventilated, and a double skin so that birds can be nested inside that mailbox looking shape, which apparently the scientists say they like a lot, mailbox shapes. And then the outside has this structure that can support the weight of a random sea lion that decides to rest on this bird in this habitat that is increasingly endangered because of climate change. And so just this year, uh, a few months ago in fact, we launched our first 3D printed nests for scientists to test uh, on that island and we'll see the results very soon. But we're, we're continuing to work on this project uh, moving forward and uh, with new species of birds that are also endangered on different islands. Um, also, we're working with an organization in coral reef restoration. And this is a scan of, a, of coral. Uh, and they asked if we could 3D print it out of calcium carbonate, which is what coral excrete. But it's not because this would be good for coral reef restoration. In this case, we're using it for education to demonstrate how increased acidity in an ocean dissolves calcium carbonate. And this is one of the big problems with uh, coral, coral reef uh, 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 demise. And so this is for educational purposes. But the scientists who visit our lab said, well, wait a minute, that looks like exactly the habitat that coral larvae would love to grow up in. And so now we're working on the production of thousands of objects that will be tested in the oceans around the world for coral reef restoration. And if they prove to be successful, we'll be making millions of these objects uh, for that purpose. And so the final way we're bringing this all together is a project that we just launched last week, in fact. So this is the only time I'm, this is the second time I'm showing this uh, in, in public. But it's called the th Cabin of 3D Printed Curiosities. It's a cabin that we've been working on for about a year <clears throat> based on many of our different technologies. It's a cabin that is comprised of about 4,500 ceramic components that com comprise the cladding system of this cabin. And they're made in such a way that every tile is the same, but we designed it so that the printer would have a little mistake along the way so that everyone is actually unique. We printed seven at a time on six machines, and in this case, Every little ceramic object reaches out and grabs the sun. This is actually on the day of the solstice, uh, when it's just reaching the highest point of, of noon. We've tested this in a number of ways. It uses our, our, our 
G-code experiments to create this kind of micro-shading textile surface. We call it the seed stitch tile. It's hung onto a surface, in this case, a 3D printed surface. The front facade, I showed it earlier, but is comprised of all our waste materials, sawdust, chardonnay, coffee, uh, cement. And you can see that corner detail where the ceramic meets those materials. And each tile, uh, a large number of the tiles hold succulents and air plants that thrive well in the California environment. So hidden away in the secret garden <coughs> is this 3D printed cabin of curiosities. The interior is made of a 3D printed bioplastic. Uh, it's white, but it's backlit because of its translucency. And so it can not only take on the shadow of light, and it's not unlike uh, pressed tin surfaces that you might find in traditional buildings, but in this case, every surface is different. But it's backlit so we can change the mood of the interior. We can change it from pink to yellow to green to any color of the spectrum. And you can see the shadow and relief of each interior surface. And not only is the interior 3D printed, but the objects of the interior are emerged from our studio as well. And so you see some of the bad ombres in the back and some of our experiments. But the furniture and the lighting is also 3D printed. You see the coffee coffee pot, which is going to the Cooper Hewitt on the, t on the coffee table that's 3D printed. Oh, that's the coffee table, except it's not made out of coffee. And at night, the interior looks like this, and like this, and like that. Thank you guys very much. <laughs>
we were having, uh, is that the picture of it? There it is. So it's a, it's a little bit crude because we can only print in sizes about this big. And so some of these are hand stitched and the inside's a little bit messy because it's put together. And then it was glazed in, as we call it at Berkeley, toilet bowl white. Do you guys know that? Do I sound like a ceramic bowl? <laughs> yeah, so I, I don't know. It's, it's a test. Yeah. What else? Yes. Mm -hmm. Did I say it was a good idea? I don't know. I black out when I'm up here. I said, I, I meant to say, did I say that? I said there are air plants and succulents that work well in the California environment. I didn't know if, if I, I may have said it because I have no idea. What I, oh, okay. Oh, no, I don't remember saying it was a good idea. We think it's a good idea <laughs> to make, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks. What else? Yes. Who? Um, you know, it's it's funny. They look like they look like different things, don't they? Um, the, some people think they look like the bottom of these bottles. Also, you know, I would say what really determines them is the natural geometries that come out of a polygonal subdivision surface modeler, which is that now I sound like a, a guy who spends a lot of time on, in 3D uh, modeling. But basically, you have a hexagon geometry, and that hexagon geometry is divided into different pieces, and we're able to push and pull some of them back and forward. Uh, and so we wanted a hexagon geometry because they close pack. You know, we can tile them together, but I think that's, the, that's kind of the inherent geometry that comes from them, and that's where the form is born from. Yeah. Uh, yes, and it's a question I've been asked a lot. We haven't done it yet, but fundamentally, all of these tiles could be taken and grounded up into a powder, and we could 3D print them. We could, we could do that. We don't operate at any uh, manufacturing scale where that is necessary for us right now. I'll say that the entire ceramic surface is made uh, probably 80% out of the waste clay that is left over by students from the ceramic department at UC Berkeley every semester. And so, so that we put that to good use. And, it, and there's some really, I don't know if I have good photos of it, but you can see that it's slightly variegated and multicolored. And there's some cases in there where there's these beautiful irons and rust starting to emerge. And so it feels very different. Um, but so we could do that. We could grind it up in powder, but we just haven't had a reason to or an opportunity to. And I guess we could take the the uh, clay and grind it up and turn it into grog. We could take, we are working with a group on campus to take all our PLA and we give it to them and they grind it up with new PLA and then they make new filament out of it. But uh, I, don't, I don't know how, how fruitful that is gonna be for them either. It's just an experiment in the engineering department. Just, just an experiment. I just offended all, all the engineers in the room. Yeah. Yes? Oh, how you, so the question is, how do you stick grape skins together? Um, well, when the grape skins are ground, they make a, f a flower. And so that, that flower has a little bit of stickiness to it as well. And so we can put in a lot of different materials. And, and each one is different. It's hard to get the rubber to stick together. And so there's a certain kind of dry glue that we put in. In the case of uh, the Chardonnay grape skins, I, th I think all we put in was a little bit of sugar. And that allowed it to be really sticky. And that, that's what helped it stick together, yeah. Can we use Yeah, so the question was, um, what kind of printer are we using in the coffee and the grape skins and the sawdust? So all the materials we, we invented are printed on what's called a binder jet printer. 
and a binder jet printer takes a, a bed of dry powder and over the top prints and sprays a very fine mist of, of water and alcohol. And so that's the kind of printer. And basically that goes layer by layer. And so in the end, the object that you've made is encased in dry powder that supports that object. And so it's the most forgiving in terms of producing a very complex object because any kind of overhang that you have, uh, you have the possibility to support it with all the powder that exists around it. And all that, that powder that's left over, you can actually take it and put it back into the machine and print again. So there's very little waste involved in that process uh, as well. So, so that's what that technology, it's one of the oldest forms of 3D printing and it's not very common anymore. Um, but the patents are expiring or have expired on that technology. So I have a feeling we'll see a ramp up very quickly of that technology again very soon. There was a question. There was one other question. Sure. Yes. Yes. Well, this is this is what I'm working on, and so, uh, you know, what it is is basically, it's a. Uh, so I, a lot of these objects were made uh, using a software that I was part of very early on at Autodesk, and uh, that software is no longer in existence. But what was exciting about that software is that when we model objects in a three-dimensional program, we have to send it over to a translator that can talk to a 3D printer. And that turns into a bunch of numbers. <coughs> and it's a very boring thing, and that's why everybody's leaving when you talk about things like G-code. <coughs> but when you do that, well, I'm about to change the subject now. When you do, when you do that, um, you've lost control to another software platform that does all the slicing for you. And that, I think that's one of the biggest dilemmas in 3D printing. But if you can take control of that language, then you are, you are in greater power to control what comes out of the 3D printer. And so what that particular software that I was involved in very early on that doesn't exist anymore was basically a 3D modeling program that was visualizing directly G-code, which are all these numbers. And that was very beautiful for me because you could control uh, the way something looked, and it would, it would show you exactly what the robot was going to do. And so what we're trying to do now in Grasshopper is uh, take advantage of that way of thinking so that we can take very much control of the behavior of the movement of the robot so we know exactly where material is deposited and what dimension it's being deposited and how much is being deposited. And that's, I think that's opening up new possibilities. So you can imagine that there are plenty of tools in 3D software that say, look like this all of a sudden, be all spiky or curvy. But could you do that with a bunch of numbers and curves and say, do that, I want the, I want the line to do this based on a mathematical formula. And when you take it out of the realm of, of math, which I'm not very good at, or programming, which I'm not very good at, but in, and you put it in the realm of visualization, uh, which I think I'm okay at, then it becomes very exciting because I can imagine the way we can control form using a bunch of lines and thinking about it the way a robot dances. Hi. <laughs> so the question is, out of all the materials I've printed with, which is my favorite and why? And the answer is clay. <laughs> 